When we introduced ourselves to the prophet Elijah in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 17 last week, we noted that there is a very particular context in which the life of Elijah is set, and it's essentially twofold. On the one hand, negatively, he ministers within the context of conflict with Baal worship. And as we saw in connection with him being fed by the ravens last week, that's immensely significant. These miracles that take place in Elijah's experience and through his ministry are not simply accidental in their style and quality. They are shaped in a particular way in order to conflict with the powers of darkness represented by the false religion of Baal worship that has invaded the people of God, as we saw at the end of chapter 16. So part of the context of his ministry is that his ministry is shaped in order to destroy Baal worship, in order to demonstrate that Jehovah alone can do what Baal professes to be able to do. And so the whole ministry of Elijah has to be seen against that background. The second context in which he ministers is the context that we've seen again and again in our studies in 1 Kings, and that is that he, by contrast with the kings whom we've seen up here, one after another, he is a man who exhibits absolute faithfulness and trust in the covenant word of God. And we cannot understand either Elijah's power in prayer or the power of his ministry unless we understand that what this man is doing is simply taking God at his word, at face value. None of these things Elijah does does he conjure up out of his own imagination as a good thing to do to give Baal a whammy. Everything he does, he does on the basis of God's revelation. And as we saw, what he does in connection with the drought and the famine is simply to go to God and to say to God, as though he were pointing to him at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, you said when the people did this kind of thing, there would be famine and need. There isn't famine and need. Be faithful to your promise. And he is the boldness, the shamelessness of which Jesus speaks in connection with the importunate widow. The boldness and shamelessness to say to God, you promised you would do it, you're not doing it. Be faithful to your promise. And it is to that kind of shameless, in the New Testament literally impudent boldness, that God responds and says, I did promise, and I've been waiting for somebody to come who really believed me and say to me, you promised. You remember how James, who speaks about this prayer of faith that characterizes Elijah, also says to his contemporaries, the reason you don't have is because you don't ask. And here is Elijah who asks. Now, in these verses, 7 to 24, two events take place. The first, the provision of the need of the widow's family with Elijah. The second, the re-resurrection or resuscitation of the widow's son. But as a matter of fact, all three stories in chapter 17 belong together. We have a series of three miracles here, and you see that there is a kind of mounting climax to them. In the first, all that is involved is the security of and provision for the prophet, and God sends ravens to feed him. In the second place, it's a larger circle of people who need to be fed, and they are fed and satisfied by the miracle of the widow's jar and jug. And then in the third story, the situation that confronts Elijah is much more critical. It's not just that he's in danger of dying 
or that the family is in danger of dying. It is that death has actually struck right into the heart of the family and the widow's son has died. And so there is, as it were, a mounting sense of God's power in each of these three miracles. And it's that mounting sense of God's power in each of these three miracles. And you see the difference between the first of them and the third of them. In the first of them, Elijah is so confident that he's able to go to King Ahab and say, here's the deal, no more rain except at my say-so. But you see, he's now at the end of the chapter confronted with death. And now he is to plead with God. In a sense, he is a man with great confidence in God's Word at the beginning of the chapter. At the end of the chapter, he's totally perplexed about what God is doing. He's still shameless. Look at what he says to God. He says to God, My God, have you brought tragedy upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? But now in his own emptiness, he is discovering an expression of the power of God that was greater than what he'd seen at the beginning of the chapter. And of course, it is that mounting sense of the power of God, his increasing experience of the power of God, that enables him then in the next chapter, in what is the greatest of all the miracles of Elijah's ministry to confront the hosts of the prophet of Baal and put them to flight. And so you see, and we'll see this in a different way later on if we've time, you'll see the way in which the Lord is preparing him, as it were, stage by stage for the great confrontation, strengthening his faith, so that when the time of the great crisis comes, he's going to be able to call upon God that the God who answers by fire, he will be God. And that is so characteristic of the way in which the Lord works, as we will see, I think, presently. I want to focus attention in this section on two things. The first, more generally, is to look at the fact that each of these experiences of Elijah is an experience of the miraculous. And because there is so much in what follows in Elijah's ministry and also in Elisha's ministry, I think it's very helpful for us to look at what takes place here and to ask ourselves, what is the significance of this miraculous that takes place in the ministry of the prophets Elijah? and Elisha. And then secondly, if we've time, which we may not have tonight, I want to think about the nature, the inside nature of Elijah's personal experience. So let me say, first of all, a number of things about these miracles and the other miracles. What's the significance of a family being fed by this cruise of oil and a little flower, of a boy being raised from the dead, of an axe head that's fallen into the water, suddenly floating, of food that was poisonous, suddenly being cured, as it were. It's very important for us to try and understand the significance of this extraordinary divine intervention. And there are five things I want to say about them. First of all, these miracles of Elijah and Elisha, and we might say all miracles, these miracles, and this is more important than it might first sound, these miracles are all, by definition, extraordinary. They are all, by definition, extraordinary. In the Christian church, there have been waves of time when people have taken the mistaken position that miracles are ordinary for Christians. If we don't have miracles, then we're not really Christians. 
And it's very important for us to notice in the Bible, the reason why the miraculous is so impressive is precisely because it's so extraordinary. It is not ordinary. It is not the normal way in which God operates. It is an extraordinary way in which God operates. If it were the normal way in which God operates, it wouldn't draw anybody's attention to anything. And that's indicated not only by the remarkable things that we see Elijah and Elisha doing, but also by the fact that in the course of biblical history, miracles are very extraordinary. People sometimes say the Bible is full of the miraculous. It's not actually. There are only four or perhaps five very short periods in the whole history of the Bible when anything quotes miraculous happens. And those miracles tend to be clustered in four or five periods that are about 20 to 40 years long. You know what they are. The first of them is the Exodus that's full of the miraculous. The second is the period of the ministry of Elijah and Elisha, full of the miraculous. The third is the period of the exile and the ministry of Daniel. And the fourth is the period of the ministry of our Lord Jesus, but just its last three years. And the miracles that we see in the apostles. Far from being ordinary in terms of God's dealings with his people from Adam right through to John on the island of Patmos, there are actually very few periods in the history of redemptive grace in which God has, as it were, broken into the ordinary regulation of life and done things that are so totally astonishing. So the first thing for us to notice is that miracles are, by definition, extraordinary. The Bible is not saying to us here, Elijah could do these things, you ought to be able to do them too. No, the Bible is saying to us the very fact that these miracles take place so infrequently in biblical history is an indication to us that these miracles have a very particular message to bring to bear upon us. The second thing that we should note about the miracles of these two prophets is that one of their central functions is confirmatory. They are in nature extraordinary. They are in function confirmatory. Now, you actually see that in this passage in three different places. First of all, in verse 1, where Elijah says to Ahab, the proof of the fact that my God is the living God is this miracle that you will see me perform. It's emphasized again in verse 14. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. And then you notice verse 16, the jar of flour was not used up, the jug of oil did not run dry. The words are repeated, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. And then thirdly, after the resuscitation or resurrection of the dead boy, verse 26, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. You see, these miracles are given through Elijah in order to confirm Elijah's identity, in order to confirm his word, and in order to authenticate him as a God-sent messenger. And that's exactly what you find when you turn again to the pages of the New Testament and ask yourself, what's the function of these miracles in the New Testament? The miracles in the New Testament are not divine pyrotechnics sent to make us say, wasn't that terrific? I wish I could do that. Miracles in the New Testament 
are given by God in order to confirm the authenticity, the divine origin of the messenger he has sent. Now, you see that uh, stated. Let me give you three places in which that's stated very clearly in the New Testament. First of all, in connection with Jesus in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 22. This is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. What was the function of the miraculous in the ministry of Jesus? They were divine pointers to say, this man is exactly who he claims to be. The New Testament says the function of the miraculous, it has other functions, but a central function of the miraculous in the ministry of Jesus was the same as the function of the miraculous in the ministry of Elijah. It was God's way of saying You need to listen to this man because he is my messenger. Find a similar thing said in Hebrews 2, 2 to 4. And uh, I think it's interesting that the three verses I want you to look at, or three passages I want you to look at, come from different authors in the New Testament. Hebrews 2. You remember it's speaking about uh, how we need to take heed to the gospel. If the message spoken by angels was binding, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Well, we know those words very well, but we don't know the words that follow perhaps so well. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. What were these miracles doing? The miracles were confirming, attesting the divine origin of what the messengers were saying. They were God's finger pointing and saying, this person comes with my authority. And Paul speaks, you remember, when he's battling for the authenticity of his own ministry to the Corinthians in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He speaks about the amazing things that were done through his ministry. And he puts it like this in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. He says, The things that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, and miracles, were done among you with great perseverance. You see, the Corinthians, or some of them, were belittling Paul's ministry as an apostle. They were saying, he's not really an apostle. Look at him, he's weak, he's poor, he's fragile. You can't even trust his word. And Paul says, here are the authenticating marks that I have been sent by God as an apostle. These signs and wonders, these miracles are God's way of pointing his finger to me and saying, this man brings my message. So what we see throughout the whole of the Bible, we see in a very crystal clear form in the ministry of Elijah. By these miraculous signs, God is saying, this man is my messenger. He brings my revelation. He comes with my authority. You need to listen to what he's saying. The third thing that we can notice in these miracles, as in all miracles, although it's not always as clear, I think, as it is in these miracles, the third uh, element in the significance of the miraculous is that miracles occur generally in times of kingdom necessity. They are extraordinary. They are confirmatory they take place in times of kingdom necessity. If it's true that out of, let's say, 3,000 years of Bible history, there are only 150 years of that 3,000-year span in which the miraculous is clustered, then 
aren't you bound to ask the question, why in these particular times? And the answer to that question is that these various times in which the miraculous is clustered all have one thing in common. The time of Moses and the Exodus, the critical time of Elijah and Elisha, the near destruction of the kingdom of God in the time of the Babylonian exile, and the critical turning point for the kingdom of God in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles. What is at stake in each of these occasions? What is at stake in each of these occasions is whether there's going to be a kingdom of God or not in the future. That's the issue in the days of the Exodus. Is this kingdom that God is bringing into being, is it all going to dissolve in the desert? And God comes, as it were, to the defense of his kingdom by mighty, extraordinary workings. We know that that was the case in the time of Elijah and Elisha. The kingdom of God was tottering on the brink of extinction, and God comes in and he defends his kingdom. The same thing in the days of the exile. You look at what happens in Babylon. How many are still standing on their feet? How many Jews are still standing on their feet when Nebuchadnezzar says, at the sound of my band, you all bow down and you worship? Only three. Daniel presumably, who knows where he was? He wasn't in the crowd. We might add And there was another fellow, Daniel, somewhere else. That was all that was left. It's unimaginable. But we we know that can happen. And it happened in the days of the Babylonian exile. There may have been those who were lukewarm, who wished that they didn't have to do it, but did it. But there were only three young men of that multitude who were there in exile who stubbornly kept on their feet and said, I am not going to bow down to anyone except the living and true God. And if they were removed from the scene, there would just be one. The future of the kingdom of God, as it were, was hanging by a thin thread. And God came in in mighty power and held his kingdom together. And the same was true of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a, I think it's an, a very important thing to notice, uh, because people are very confused about this, too, that demon possession is not all over the Bible. You don't get demon possession in every page of the Bible. And if you look at the Acts of the Apostles, there's hardly any demon possession in the Acts of the Apostles. It's there, but there doesn't seem to be very much of it. But you look at the three last years of Jesus' ministry, and all hell is let loose in one small country. Why? Because the entire kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness are at stake during those three years of Jesus' ministry. And so all hell is let loose. So powerful are the forces of hell that there is one man wandering around in Gadara who calls himself Legion because it is so important to the powers of darkness to try to do what they can to destroy the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ that they will stick a thousand demons inside the life of one man if there is some way they can destroy the ministry of Jesus. You think of the agonies Jesus goes through, the hellish temptations he goes through, the fact that he's betrayed by somebody who's been a bosom companion for three years, the wicked way in which he was treated by Jew and Gentile. What's at stake? What's at stake is the kingdom of God. That's what's at stake. And that's why there are these mighty demonstrations. And you see it similarly in the Acts of the Apostles. Again, in the Acts, it's a very interesting thing. The Apostles are not running around the world doing miracles. They do them very sparingly. And when there are these miraculous signs, you catch a sense that 
the door is opening here to some ultimate profound conflict. And the kingdom of God needs for its future security to be defended and established by powerful signs and wonders. The fourth thing to say about these miracles is that they are frequently, they are frequently demonstrations of mercy. Not all of them are demonstrations of mercy in the same way. Uh, It's embarrassing if you borrow an axe and the head flies off. It would be embarrassing to me if you and I were playing golf and you had a new Mizuno driver that cost 300 pounds and I said, do you mind if I try it? And as I hit the ball, the head flew off. That would be tremendously embarrassing. But neither you or I would think the whole kingdom of God is at stake here. But apparently when an axe head falls off among this beleaguered little band of prophets, they are in such exigencies. They are in such exigencies. They are at the verge in which the kingdom of God is scoffed and mocked. God steps in and shows his power in mercifully delivering them. And many of the miracles of Jesus are like this, aren't they? They are acts of singular mercy and compassion of all, at all different levels. Everything from what takes place at the wedding of Cana of Galilee to raising Lazarus from the dead, outpourings of mercy and benevolence and kindness. And you see what they're all saying. They're saying this is what God is like. He is exquisitely, tenderly merciful to his needy people. You can trust him. They're signs of the compassion of God. And then fifthly, they are signs of God's future victory. By definition, extraordinary. In function, confirmatory. In times of kingdom necessity. Frequently demonstrations of mercy. And finally, they are signs of God's future victory. And they are all like this. I like to think of it this way uh, because I'm simple and it helps me. You know how you sometimes go into a room, you switch on the light, and for whatever reason, it goes on and boom, it's off. There's a fuse. But you just manage to maneuver yourself through the room because you've had a moment when the light has switched on and you're able to get your bearings and you see what the room will be like when it's fully illumined. And divine miracles are like that. They are just moments in which the way in which this world that, as Shakespeare says, is so out of joint, has been broken and marred by sin. You get momentary glimpses here and there of the way in which when the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ comes to its consummation, there will be this glorious reversal of the effects of sin in the establishing of the kingdom of God. The old-fashioned theologians uh, in the Middle Ages, they used to discuss to and fro how you defined a miracle. And and they tended to say a miracle is something that is contrary to nature. That's the first thing about a miracle. It's contrary to nature. But you know, they were wrong. The first thing about a miracle is not that it's contrary to nature. The first thing about a miracle is that it's contrary to nature perverted by the fall, by sin. A miracle doesn't undo the natural by the supernatural. A miracle repairs the broken through the supernatural. And you see this wonderfully here. In a world that is out of joint, where the curse of God has come upon the land, you get this momentary glimpse in Elijah's life of a man being fed by one of the 
servants of God from his non-human kingdom. And here is a woman and her son, and they are in dire need in a land that's full of paganism. And God does a paradoxical thing. He sends a prophet to them, and the prophet provides for their needs. And here, finally, you know how we sometimes say, I don't know if doctors say it any longer, but, you know, they say he died of natural causes. Nobody dies of natural causes. Nobody in the world has ever died of natural causes. We die because of sin. We die of unnatural causes. And here is a boy who has died of unnatural causes. And here is a prophet who is stretching his own life out upon the dead life of the boy. God is not acting against nature. He's acting against sin and repairing nature. Now, those things are true of these miracles and they're true generally of all miracles. But take these particular miracles and you see in way, the way in which the doing of the miraculous at the hands of Elijah really is not only defending the kingdom of God, but making invasions into the kingdom of darkness. And you see it in these ways. Remember what we saw last week about the context in which Elijah ministers. The invasion of Baal worship and the ritual of Baal worship. Baal, the storm god, the rider of the clouds, the one upon whom fertility and therefore uh, physical provision depended. Baal, the god who was then overwhelmed by the god Moat, death, and needed help if he was to be resuscitated and the cycle of provision of crops would be provided again. And now set that background against the light of what happens to Elijah. Where has Elijah been? He's been told by God to go to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, And there, you notice, he will, one, be safe, and two, be fed. And then the brook dries up. So where is he to go now? Well, he's to go now to Zarephath of Sidon. But we've already read about Sidon. Look back to chapter 16 and verse 17. Ahab not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, Now, if that was all that had been said about him, that would be enough. But then, apparently, there is something worse than that. And what is worse than that is, he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal. Now, here's a king, Ethbaal, who is so devoted to Baal that he's taken Baal into his name. He is Ethbaal. And do you notice where he is king, where this epicenter of Baal worship is? It's Sidon. And where is it that Elijah is told to go? Talk about preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He is going to be safe. He is going to be fed in the very heart of Baal territory. In a sense, this is even more remarkable than them climbing up Mount Carmel and having the great prophetic context. This is him, as it were, going into the very jaws of hell and saying, the Lord is able to keep me here and not only keep me here, but because this is the very epicenter of Baal worship, it is in the very epicenter of Baal worship that it needs to be demonstrated that the Lord Yahweh is the true God. Just like when we turn to the New Testament, that's true of Jesus, isn't it? Where is the very center of Satan's power? It's in death. 
And so in order to deliver those, Hebrews 2 later on, in order to deliver those who all their lives suffer from the fear of death, and to deliver us from him who has the power of death. Where does Jesus have to go? He is to go into the jaws of death on the cross in order to deliver us from it. And that's what we see happening here in the case of Elijah. He is going to the very center of Baal worship to lay John the Baptist like the axe at the very root of the tree. And what happens? It's absolutely marvelous to see what happens. It's in that very context where Baal professes to rule that Elijah becomes a living demonstration that Baal is incapable of ruling or providing. But Yahweh, the true and living God, provides. And you notice at the end of the passage, gives life. Here is Baal, and he is impotent to do anything about the famine. But God can feed Elijah through ravens, and then through a poor, unsupported widow. God can take the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. And remember what happens to Baal? He is overcome by the god Moat. And he needs help to get back on his feet. And here is a boy who has been, as it were, overcome by the God Mot in death. And what he needs to get back on his feet is the faith of the servant of God and the coming of the power of God. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful illustration of the way in which in Scripture God comes to the defense and protection and provision of his people. And so as we think about the miraculous in the unique experience of Elijah, this passage discloses to us Not so much the supernatural power of Elijah, but the greatness of Elijah's God and the absolute trustworthiness of this living and true God by comparison with all other idols. The folly of trusting in idols is that they can never deliver to us the things they profess to give the wisdom of trusting in the true and the living God is that he can. And as Elijah stretches himself in the ministry of a prophet over the death of this little boy, he surely points forward to the way in which the true prophet of God, Jesus Christ, would stretch himself over our death on the cross. And by it, raise us also to life. These words that uh, Elijah speaks over the boy to the boy's parent are, in a sense, to be heard echoing down through the centuries until Jesus Christ stretches himself over us and breathes graciously his spirit into us and we are raised to life and he takes us in his arms back to his father and our father and says to him see your child is alive thanks be to God for what he has done for us let's pray heavenly father We bow before your word because it is the living expression of your very character, your wisdom, your power. There are many things in it that just stretch our imagination and our understanding to the limits. And there are also demonstrations in it of unusual power 
but lead us to trust you. And we pray, Father, that you would give us that grace of faith to trust your word as your servant Elijah did. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, for your kingdom stretched as it is throughout the world, but especially in places where it seems to totter on the verge of disintegration. And we pray that you would come in mighty power to protect and to provide for your people, that your church throughout the world may not be overcome by the gates of hell, but that our Lord Jesus will keep building it in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And this we pray together for his great name's sake.